Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, well, we're going to start. We'll, we'll go ahead and start right now since uh, it seems like uh, this is what we're getting uh, while we're here. And uh, thanks for coming to our industry panel here at Otakuthon uh, 2018. Uh, I'm Sam Fanansky. I'm the president and founder of J Novel Club. Uh, and uh, we have two guests on our panel today. Uh, Manish Bagetti, who is uh, one of the editors for uh, us, and uh, Derek Ko, who is a translator uh, for us, and they both uh, drove up to uh, uh, Montreal here for the festivities. Uh, so why don't you introduce yourself and say a little bit more about uh, yourself. So. Um, hi, my name is Manish Bagetti, and I'm from actually Mississauga, uh, Ontario. I'm an editor at J Novel Club, who worked on uh, Ari Ferretta in Another World with My Smartphone, and more recently, an Archdemon's Dilemma, How to Love Your Elf Bride. And uh, aside from uh, those three titles of the Novel Club, I also work on a variety of visual novels, video games, etc., uh, for other companies, which I won't mention here, because it's not a panel for them. <laughs> And how are you there? And so I'm uh, local to KW Ontario, uh, and I do two translations for J Novel Club. Uh, one is the magic in this other world is too far behind, and the other is uh, Elf Ride. Yeah, so that's uh, they're they do two really good books for us. Uh, I mean, obviously, Ari Freta is uh, one of the most popular titles, and the print version of that is actually published by Seven Seas. Uh, so if you want to pick that up and view this hall, I'm sure you can. Uh, and uh, uh, in Archdemon's Dilemma, uh, How to Love Your Elf Bride um, is just started. We just announced that, uh, well, like right before Anime Expo, I think? One, yeah. yeah, like one week before Anime Expo, and it's a good way to get. And of course, in enough, uh, the magic in this other world is too far behind. Uh, has been a smash success since we started publishing it, I guess, like four months ago or so. So already about, we already uh, finished publishing for uh, four months, uh, for uh, four volumes in. So uh, that's really great. Okay, uh, let's get started with the panel. Well, I'll talk directly to the panel. <laughs> um, just sort of a survey the crowd here. How many of you have actually heard of Jane Novel Club before and are not just here? Uh, because you're like, what are we going to do? Uh, how many of you have not actually heard of Jane Novel Club before, say, like today, or this kind of convention? Okay, well, you've got a bunch of people here who've never actually heard of us, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you a brief introduction to our company and what we do, uh, and then I'll try and speed through things and get right to the announcements. So, uh, we are a digital publisher and a novel streaming service. So uh, we published over 100 volumes of ebooks uh, last year, uh, and we're gonna probably do like 120, 150 this year. Uh, we have over 20 ongoing series, it's more like 25, 27 at this point, uh, and there's a monthly subscription for 495 US dollars, uh, where members can read the latest volumes as they're being translated. Uh, so basically, we're like a crunchy roll for light novels, and we <coughs> upload the uh, one part of a volume every week, uh, and, uh, and and you can read them if you're a member. You can read the latest parts as they're being translated. Uh, but we also publish the ebooks themselves. So once we're finished with the translations for a whole volume, we then uh, do some final proofreading. We add in all the, the color images in the front, and we put them on Amazon, on Kobo, on uh, Bookwalker, on Nook, uh, iBooks. We basically sell them anywhere you can buy ebooks, and so you can also just buy the ebooks if you want to. Um, Either way is great. We also have a premium membership uh, where you get a free credit for an ebook every month, uh, and you can use those to get any of our ebooks and uh, directly from us and download them straight from our servers. And those are DRM-free uh, EPUBs, and they usually have bonus content and stuff. Like for example, uh, uh, the Magic in the Southern World is too far behind. The premium ebook uh, comes with these short stories that you can only actually get if you bought the physical book in a specific bookstore in Japan, but we got the rights to all of those, and, and if you buy the premium ebook from us, you can get all those short stories, uh, which are really cool. And a lot of our books have those sorts of special bonuses, so it's really nice. Um, let's uh, take a look at some of the series for you, too. Well, this is not even all of them. This doesn't even include the ones I announced at Anime Expo, but uh, we've got big titles like How a Realist Hero Rebuilt the Kingdom, uh, out of the aforementioned Ari Furuta, In Another World with My Smartphone, which had the anime last year, The Magic in the Swirls Too Far Behind, Outbreak Company, which had a really great anime a couple, year, uh, couple years ago, a uh, new book we're doing called The Unwanted Undead Adventurer, which is about a guy reincarnated, well, not reincarnated, a guy who got eaten by a dragon and then ends up uh, becoming an undead monster, but he still has his 
is mine, and so he's trying desperately to regain his humanity. Uh, Grimgar Fantasy and Ash, which is a just amazing uh, uh, light novel series, and that also had a really good anime about two years ago. Uh, Invaders of the Robojoma, which is a really long series, but is, is probably the best harem series ever. I, I think I'm going to just say that it's it's 100% harem, but it's it's also really good. <laughs> it's a uh, it's amazing uh, combination. You really just learn to love all the characters just after a couple volumes. It seems like a like a kind of a silly harem comedy in the first six volumes, but then. Starting volume seven, it all opens up and becomes a much, much bigger story. It's really amazing. Uh, we also have two books that are actually an anime. They're airing this season right now. Uh, the Master of Ragnarok and Blesser of Einherjar, uh, which is uh, airing on Crunchyroll. And uh, it's about an isekai uh, series where a young Japanese boy gets uh, transferred to a, a <coughs> seems to be another world. Uh, and it's sort of like, uh, well, it's like ancient Norse mythology kind of stuff, lots of uh, uh, battles with phalanxes and spears, and, and he ends up running his own clan, and it's a it's a pretty cool combination of your normal isekai harem and also like medieval battles and stuff. And then of course, how not to summon the demon lord, which has really been a huge breakout hit on the anime since the anime started airing this summer. Uh, and that's uh, uh, this one. I've got one thing to give away. I don't know exactly how it's given away, but this is a clear file from I don't know to summon the demon lord, uh, and uh, that we also published the original. Uh, book for that. So uh, we published the light novels for that series, uh, and I uh, hope you guys you can uh, check it out. If you if you like the anime, definitely check out the original books. They are just as sexy and have so much more interesting, you know, information about the characters and what they're thinking, and uh, it's really good. Okay, so uh, I made a whole ton of announcements at Anime Expo a couple weeks ago, and I'm not sure if you're all familiar with what I did with what we announced, but I'm going to go over them. Uh, real quickly here uh, before we get to otaku fun announcements. Uh, so first announcement I did was that we had a new publishing partner, which is Kanaka. A very big announcement. Uh, they're obviously one of the, they are the biggest publisher of light novels in Japan, and we licensed two books from them. The first one is Kokoro Connect, uh, which is a great light novel series, uh, and, a, and also a really good anime a couple of years ago, I guess it's like four years ago at this point. Uh, and it's 11 volumes long, it's finished, uh, and uh, it's basically a, well, it starts off as a, a, a club in the high school, and then they end up having switching bodies and having experienced the, uh, the other person's lives, and they find out secrets about you know, everybody else in their club. Uh, and it's drama and school, uh, school hijinks and uh, lots of uh, character drama. And it's a really great book. And it won an award when it was actually published. Uh, and then there are all the other books in the series continue up with a random you know, emotion switching, and <laughs> uh, basically uh, there's an alien or something you know, called a, 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 some, you know, this little mystery who exactly is that's really messing with these people in the club for some reason, uh, and they have to sort of overcome their own uh, emotions and their own pasts, and it's a really great series. Uh, also, you might be able to tell, but the, the artist is the character designer for Kale. So, uh, <laughs> yes, it does look a lot like Kale characters, but that's the same guy. Um, also, we got a message from the author who uh, says, it brings me great pleasure to have this opportunity to share my work with the rest of the world. And as the title suggests, Kokoro Connect is a story about hearts, something that truly transcends all cultural barriers, and I hope you'll connect with it too. In the meantime, I intend to craft even more stories for everyone in the world to enjoy. So uh, the author really uh, is happy that his, his, uh, uh, their work is finally getting uh, published in English. Our second licensing announcement from Kawakawa is Amami Brilliant Park. Uh, which is also just a super fun series uh, by the same author as Film Full Metal Panic. Uh, and uh, the, basically, it's sort of, I like to say it's like if Roller Coaster Tycoon uh, was an anime. <laughs> so the basic plot is that there's this old right now amusement park in the outskirts of Tokyo and it's not making any money. And they bring in this guy, Hiroseya, who is this hotshot young kid. Uh, you know, uh, ex, uh, ex, he was like ex, uh, uh, ex youth idol or something, and he's like gonna come in there and fix up the park. But it turns out that the park is actually run by refugees from a magic kingdom. So the actual mascot is not just a guy wearing a suit, it's really just that, yeah, that's him. <laughs> and all the fairies and the, the people running the park are actually like, you know, magical creatures, but that's a secret. They, they're trying to harvest the magic the happiness energy from Tokyo to, to, uh, to manage to survive. <laughs> so it's very important the park doesn't shut down or they'll all die or something. Uh, so it's actually a really happy-go-lucky series and got lots of great humor, but it's got a good heart to it as well. 
Uh, and so I uh, hope you guys uh, check it out if you haven't. And of course, check out the anime. I had the anime by Kill Annie uh, a couple of years ago, which is really great. But the anime had like really changed the plot. So the, it's not the plot from the books is really different than the plot from the anime. So you can really enjoy both as almost separate uh, works, and it's uh, really cool. Uh, the author from this one also sent a message. It was just, I'm curious to see how the rest of the populace, like Fumo, Drum, and me, I can't wait. <laughs> so all the, all the mascot characters, you know, they speak like with really funny ways of speaking in Japanese, and the, the populace at the end. And so the author was wondering how in the world we translate that. So you'll have to buy the book to find out. <laughs> um, or, or be a member of either on uh, another thing we like we announced before Anime Expo was uh, uh, the Easy Dungeon Master. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole description, but uh, it's a isekai story, but also dungeon building. Uh, that's a, a yet another niche uh, genre in light novels. But uh, the main character gets summoned to uh, another world and ends up becoming the dungeon master of this dungeon. And bandits are constantly trying to conquer the dungeon. If they, if they, they kill the dungeon core, uh, then he dies too. And of course, the dungeon core is this cute bond. So, <laughs> uh, but she's really demanding, and she's like, save my dungeon, and he just wants to sleep. And so he keeps spending all his dungeon points on things like pillows and stuff. Uh, anyway, it's a comedy series, it's kind of a cute, uh, it's got a lot of cute girls in it, and uh, light novel tropes, and it's also got some interesting dungeon building strategy to it. It's, it's a cool series, so uh, check that out, uh, pre is up for volume one already. Um, Here's the book that uh, you mentioned just before, uh, that uh, we have that entire translation in here. Uh, An Arch Demon's Dilemma, How to Love Your Elf Bride. Um, this story is basically, uh, it's not an easy guy, it's a fantasy story, so no one is being transported into another world here. Uh, but the uh, main character, Sakan, is like feared as like, this amazing evil sorcerer in uh, the town. And he's so, he's so feared he's called the Arch Demon uh, by, uh, by his peers. Uh, but and but one day he falls in love with this poor elf slave, um, and and has and just buys her on the spot, spends like his entire fortune to purchase her, and uh, and then sort of like he doesn't know what in the world to do with her, and she ends up, they end up being they're both super socially awkward, <laughs> but they both almost immediately fall in love with each other, and so it's a really really sweet romantic comedy, like it's not it's not really you know, it's a comedy. It has comedic parts to it, but it's just it's a sweet love story. It's really what it is in a fantasy setting with magic and uh, drama. And then there's a bunch of side characters which are also just amazing. So uh, this has gotten an amazingly good reaction. And uh, people were a little like uh, kind of off put by the original setup, but uh, trust me, read some of it, you'll find that it's got a lot of heart. It's really great. Uh, another uh, interesting title I picked up, which is brand new in Japan, it has one volume out. Um, and the next volume is going to come out next month, I think. Uh, it's called Gear Drive, and the simplest way for me to explain this is it's a shonen. It's basically, you know, you're showing an action adventure with the uh, crazy magic powers, except the main character is this, like, crazy, high-energy, twin-tailed blonde girl. Uh, her name is Auntie Kitera, <laughs> which is a pun for the ancient Greek mechanism of that was the original gear that was ever in Archeonymic. Um, <laughs> uh, but her name's Auntie, this is called Auntie. Uh, and, uh, and she, basically, she went to a magic school but could never learn any magic, and so if that happens, there's sort of a backup plan in this world where you pray to a magic giving stone, kind of, and it gives you something, like, you know, water. But anyway, she ends up getting something called gear craft, and no one's ever heard of this before, and it seems, at least as far as she can tell, all it lets her do is make it some little golden gears and spin them really fast, and she has no idea what she can do with that. Uh, but her parents, which are super supportive, what? <laughs> it's a light novel. There's like she has, both her parents are alive and they're super supportive of her adventuring activities. Um, they want to, they want her their daughter to like chase her dreams, and so they convince her to become an adventurer and figure out how to use her crazy gear powers in a way that like works. And basically, that's what she does. She goes out, has adventures, figures out how to become a superhero using crazy gear powers. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And uh, volume one is basically finished, and you can pre-order it. We're going to start with volume two as soon as it comes out in Japan. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, another link we announced is called Seirei Gensoki Spirit Chronicles. This is, has also just gotten huge res the response from the people who started reading on our site. Uh, it's a reincarnation story, but uh, it's sort of a two personalities and one body story, and uh, that makes it very unique. 
Uh, and it starts off as kind of a revenge tale, but then switches into a fish out of water in a Magic Academy kind of setting. It actually covers a lot of genres, but you really feel for the characters. And it's, um, I should say, it has a lot of heart, uh, and the characters are real, feel kind of real compared to some of some other light novels. Uh, so I know a lot of people, like when they, when they read Cleave Hemp Cliffhanger, the, the last part they post on the forums, they'd be like, what's gonna happen to, you know, character X? And, uh, it really gets people uh, involved in the story, so uh, hopefully people check that out. Uh, the, one of the uh, how many announcements did I make in advance? Real serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one is called Dare Werewolf. Uh, that's the German spelling. Uh, the Annals of Fate, and this is a reincarnation story uh, uh, about a guy reincarnates into a werewolf and then ends up becoming the vice commander of the demon lord, who's that awesome blob chick. Um, uh, and uh, he, this is actually a combination. This first volume is a combination of town building and uh, sort of um, race relations. It's the demon lord's army has conquered this particular town and it's his job to uh, to rebuild it and, and they actually don't want to cause war. So it's a very interesting and kind of mature fantasy novel. It, it, it's a little bit older, you know, skews a little bit older and tough to tackle some more serious issues for maybe some of the other easy kind we did. So uh, it's also just a quality fantasy novel uh, and uh, and it's got some good stuff in it, so you can check that out as well. Uh, now we get to the really weird stuff. I licensed two books from Hayakawa Publishing, which is a publisher in Japan that just does sci-fi, like, well, they don't just, but they're famous for doing science fiction books. Uh, like they publish Asimov in Japan, the Japanese, that sort of stuff. Uh, the first one I licensed from them is this uh, award-winning book uh, well, a book of award-winning short stories called Last and First Idol. Uh, and it won the fourth Hayakawa Science Fiction Contest Prize, the 48th Sein Award, the 27th Dark Sein Award. It just won all kinds of stuff. And it is described as an existential, widescreen, yuri, baroque, proletarian, hard, sci-fi idol story. <laughs> um, uh, it, we are actually, the, the first short story uh, literally runs the gamut from love life fan fiction to universal destruction, um, dark matter, monopoles, solar flares, uh, neural network, planetary scale, uh, consciousness evolution. It gets very hard sci-fi, let's put it that way. Um, it's an amazing story. And then the second story, Evolution Girls, is all about gotcha games and how they are the evolution of evolution. <laughs> uh, and then the final story is about uh, uh, voice actors, uh, or at least the genetic, genetically modified voice actors who use their Lagrangeal sacs to uh, overcome the limitations of physics. I believe this is about that. Yeah, um, and and can go faster than space travel. Space travel. Anyway, um, it's the basically this guy's books are all about combining otaku sensibilities with majorly hardcore sci-fi stories. So uh, just check it out, it's amazing. Uh, by the way, I designed the cover and that is the Hubble's deep field, but instead with light sticks. Okay, uh, <laughs> the uh, author Ginga Kisano uh, says that, in the universe there are infinite minds and infinite moments of time. You are but one such mind at one such moment. Why do you exist and how should you live the life you have? A truly great work of fiction is one that helps you find answers to these problems. Last and first idol will provide these answers. Thus, it is a masterpiece. <laughs> that is a quote from the author. <laughs> okay, next uh, crazy license I license from Hayakawa Shoyo, Shoujo Shobo. Um, J.K. Haru is a sex worker in another world. So, uh, I don't know if I should act. I, <laughs> I should read. I'll read, I'll read the I'll read the blurb I wrote. Okay. Uh, <laughs> record scratch. Freeze frame on Haru Koyama getting choked by a horny naked dude. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation. Not by choice, and I can tell you that. It started when my weirdo classmate Chiba tried to save me from the one right truck and got us both killed instead. Idiot. Then we got transported to another world, which I guess is like an otaku dream come true or something. Chiba ends up with cheat abilities, and what do I get? Nothing. Lucky me, I get to be a sex worker. Gotta earn money somehow, but since I have to do it, I'm gonna kick ass at it. This world treats women like even worse than the one we came from, so things can get kinda rough. Still, I've made friends with some of the girls, and if I can juggle Chiba's idiocy and Suma the Virgin's emotions on top of all the various kinks that my customers throw at me, things will be all right. Multi. 
<laughs> anyway, I don't know exactly how to describe this story. It is definitely mature. Like, there is lots of sex in it. But it's emotionless work-like sex. And <laughs> it is very realistic about sort of the life of a sort of fan, like medievalish era sex worker. But <coughs> Haru as a character, she starts off as sort of almost unlikable because she seems really shallow. But then she grows, and and uh, you feel really feel for her. And the situations that she gets that she's placed in is really harsh, right? And and meanwhile, her friend has these. You know, he's got invulnerability to physical damage, invulnerability to magical damage, and like a four times level leveling buff that he got from God. And then meanwhile, Haru gets nothing and has to, has to scrape by. It's an isekai fantasy RPG setting, but super realistic. So it's very, very interesting book. Uh, and it's hilarious, and at the same time, uncomfortable. <laughs> so you're like you're laughing at these like that what's going on and because Haru's laughing at it, but you, you know, anyway. Uh, it's an amazing novel and it's just one volume and the art that this it goes to that one volume is really great. Um, and they also got an author quote for this one. Haru who traveled from Japan to another world finally makes it to LA. Well, this was the quote for Anime Expo, so I apologize. <laughs> but I can't change her quote. Um, I hope you'll stick with Haru in this new story as she bravely makes her way in another world that is harsher and more absurd than reality, yet still familiar. So uh, that's a great book. Uh, check it out. It's translated by Emily Balestieri, uh, who is one of the best translators in the industry, and uh, I'm really happy that she did work for us. So. Another book that we just uh, licensed at Anime Expo, some classic 90s fantasy. Actually, it's barely 90s. It came out in 1999, but anyway. Um, Sorcerer Stabber Orphan. Uh, Orphan is a sorcerer dropout from the prestigious Tower of Fangs. His journey to save Azali, a girl he looked up to like a sister, has brought him to the bustling city of Tokotanta. Here, they are reunited for the first time in five years, but what is the truth behind their monstrous transformation, and just what secrets lurk behind the sword of Baal Dandres? Um, this is the contemporary to Slayers, contemporary to all these great 90s fantasy adventures, and it had an anime that was made back then, and a PlayStation game, RPG, uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, it really actually is a great title, and it's a 20 volume series uh, that is, uh, we're gonna be publishing, and actually volume one is gonna come up pretty soon. Uh, so if you like classic 90s Japanese fantasy uh, fun times, it's great. It also has a lot of humor in it, it's really funny. Uh, and uh, we have one of our, our, better trans our best translators, uh, uh, Steiner, working on it, and he's having a blast, so uh, really check it out if you like that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, one more thing we announced at Anime Expo is our print editions. Uh, so I've got here our first ever prototype. It's not really a final prototype, it's got a lot of problems, but um, <laughs> uh, that's why it's a prototype. Uh, of, uh, in Another World with a Smartphone, Volume 1, uh, that I got from the printers. Uh, this we're going to do a full scale offset printing, large print runs, 3,000 plus or so, probably quite a bit more for Sparkcom. Uh, I'm going to include all the color illustrations, all the text, high quality uh, paper. It's going to be notch bound, so be, you know, not going to fall out. Uh, it's going to be the size, so this is the same size as uh, it was published in Japan, actually. Uh, so uh, we're not going to do the tiny, tiny Bunkoban size like this, but we'll do the uh, this is Japanese P6 uh, size. So it's a little smaller maybe than like uh, Mian Press uh, light novels, but I feel like it's better for holding in a single hand. Uh, so uh, these will be good. And we're gonna do- It's the same size as a manga. Uh, it's the same size as manga, yeah. Pretty much the same size as you'll normally have manga published in. Um, and uh, we will have major distribution to all US and Canadian bookstores. So we're published, we're distributed through Ingram, and Ingram does full-scale uh, distribution to Canada. So you'll be able to purchase that in your local bookstores here uh, in Canada as well. So uh, that'll be great. And hopefully I won't mark up the Canadian dollar price too much. <laughs> we're, still, we're still working on pricing. Uh, release date for volume one of Smartphone is gonna be late 2018 or early 2019. We are actually discussing that literally this week. Um, and we'll be locking down those dates very soon. Uh, and more series to come out in print soon to be announced soon, as in like 30 seconds from now. <laughs> uh, price point, uh, I'm not gonna reveal our price point, but let's just say that we're not going to be pricing our books any different than anyone else in the market. So uh, we will be uh, pretty much uh, normal. Okay, it's time for announcements. I hear another talking about some new announcements. Uh, our first new announcement, and this is not gonna come as a surprise to too many people, I think. But I know why everybody has been asking for this, and obviously, you know, we're gonna do this. We are going to do physical editions of How Not to Summon a Demon Lord. 
So uh, we uh, obviously this has been a huge hit anime this season. We've already published the first four volumes in, in ebooks, and we're going to come out with the print editions for these uh, uh, very soon, probably late 2018, early 2019. Same time scale as smartphone. Uh, so uh, for those of you who want to own uh, Shira here in physical print, uh, you now have that opportunity. Uh, and trust me, uh, it, these books are really good. They're they're fun. Uh, they're light reading because they're isekai, but they're also uh, written by uh, an author that knows what he's doing. It's actually kind of a veteran uh, light novel author that does these books, and the writing in it shows. Like you can tell, he's actually planned things out, <laughs> and I mean that actually makes a big difference in the plotting. And I think it's one of the reasons the anime has been so, so successful. You can tell that, like it's going somewhere, which is great. It's not just about giant food dogs, but that's important. Okay. Uh, next announcement. This is an interesting one that I picked up. Echo. So how many of you remember the Vocaloid song? Echo, Echo. it was actually Meg, uh, it was actually Meg Floyd. Uh, this is, oh, we got someone in the back actually who has heard of this. This song is actually by Crusher P, uh, which is uh, uh, probably the most famous creator of English speaking Vocaloid creator. Uh, this song blew up on Nikita Nova, even though it was created by an English Vocaloid producer. Uh, I guess our, it's already been like, eight years ago now. Uh, it's got 35 million views on YouTube, for example. And this book is actually a novelization of this song uh, that was created, that was written actually by Akira, who is the author of Yumaniki, and as well as Sasami Sasa and Kanmara Nai. So uh, it's actually a very high quality light novel author who made this uh, uh, adaptation uh, of this light novel. And uh, we're going to translate it into English and uh, release it uh, very shortly. Um, all these announcements uh, that we're doing right now, they're not available on our site just yet. Uh, we're gonna be releasing these over the next week, two weeks, three weeks, uh, so within the month. Uh, but uh, I'm actually announcing things before we're ready to release them for the first time here. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to give you guys something to, to you know, uh, wet your whistle on here in the panel. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is a really cool book. The Echo, the song is, I don't know, I guess how should I describe it? It's about a very emo teenager. <laughs> <laughs> and the song is very, is very much like what is what blood is life and life is terrible. It, it's actually interesting. But Akira, the author, can turn anything into an interesting novel. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, he, that, that person really has amazing. <clears throat> okay, here is our maybe biggest announcement that we're making at this uh, at this panel. Uh, this is a, amazingly. This is a shoujo novel, but trust me, anybody will enjoy this novel. Um, it, their translation for the English title is All Routes Lead to Doom by Next Light as a Villainous. So, uh, let me describe, let me read the, the, uh, the summary here. Reincarnated into one of the Otome games that she played, Katarina is the idiotic character who is oblivious to the feelings of everyone around her and solely focused on avoiding her inevitable doom, as she knows, thanks to her knowledge of the game. And without realizing it, ends up seducing basically everyone. <laughs> so, so this is uh, uh, so that's uh, as everybody likes to call her Bakarina, uh, and she basically she was playing she loved playing with Kobe games when she was in her past life. And uh, this particular game, that character Katharina, like no matter what ending it was, whether it was a good ending or a bad ending, that character was always sentenced to death or exiled from the kingdom. She was the evil villainous character. And who does she get reincarnated into? Well, that character. And so she basically is desperately trying to avoid her fate uh, and ends up uh, basically getting all the guys. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's hilarious. It really is hilarious. And uh, we, we're, we're going to start doing this one as soon as possible. Uh, it's also, I should mention, our first title from Ichi Jinsha, uh, a new publisher or partner for us. Although Din Ichi Jinsha is now owned by Kunansha, so it's not really a new publisher, but it's, it's a new publisher, so. <laughs> uh, and we have one more book from Ichi Jinsha that I can announce. This one, I assure you, none of you have heard of, but I think it's something, it's a genre that a lot of people have been asking for us to try. And I think this is gonna be a really interesting uh, uh, book for, for a certain audience. Apparently, it's my fault that my husband's head turned into that of the beast. <laughs> this is a, uh, not a final title. Uh, we, I just, uh, we literally brainstormed this 10 minutes before the panel. Uh, the original Japanese title is Damna Sama no Kao ga Kemono na no wa Domo Watashi no Sei Rashi. So we just did a literal translation. We're, we might come up with a better English title. Uh, this is the story. Princess Rosemary has shut herself in because she sees the face of any person with negative emotions as that of a beast. 
But one day when she sees Prince Claudio, the only person who has a human face to her, she jumps at the chance and quickly marries him. But from that day, it seems like everyone else in the kingdom sees his face as a beast except for her? Is this somehow her fault? A newlywed love fantasy awaits. So this is Shoujo. 100% Shoujo Light Novel, uh, published in the Iris uh, uh, line of books. And uh, uh, it's kind of Beauty and the Beastie, uh, although it's, uh, you know, some people see them as beasts and some people not, and it's mysterious and there's magic. It's a fantasy kingdom, but it's, uh, you know, fairly realistic. So uh, I, there's actually two volumes to the series, and, I, and it's uh, done at two volumes. Uh, so I hope, uh, <coughs> you know, you guys will check it out. Uh, and uh, that maybe, you know, the, it's the kind of shoujo novels that uh, really no one has much published in the industry yet. Uh, so I don't know any how well they're going to sell. Uh, but I'd like to try, and uh, hopefully it's a good quality. Ichijinsha recommended it to us uh, as one of their best novels, so uh, I really think you guys should check it out. All right, so um, how much time do we have left? A lot, a lot of time. Half hour. I sped through this because I want to leave lots of time for questions. Uh, so uh, I am opening the floor to questions, and feel free to ask any of us questions about things, uh, and I will uh, answer them as much as possible. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you know, right in the front. Uh, I'm just curious about your relationship with uh, Seven Seas and mm -hmm. the uh, very company that you go to for mm -hmm. publishing in uh, physical format. Mm -hmm. The new uh, volume that are coming up, are do you also with Seven Seas as well? Okay, so um, the, the, let me clarify that. Uh, so um, the print editions that I'm announcing, the Demon Lord and Spark Home, uh, those will be the first print books that we are publishing ourselves. So. I'm doing the manufacturing, I'm doing the distribution, it'll be Day Health Club. Uh, so those have nothing to do with Seven Seas. On the other hand, the books that we have sub-licensed print rights to Seven Seas for, Ari Ferretta, uh, Grimdar, uh, Realist Hero, Clockwork Planet, uh, those will continue to be published by Seven Seas. So uh, we're not going to take back the series, we can get them or whatever. That, <laughs> uh, but uh, if, in the future, the uh, things that we're going to do in print, we'll, we'll be doing ourselves. Okay, more questions. Um, you there. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a, like a holy grail series that any of you would like to have the chance to work on? Oh, that's a good question. Let's go down the line. There. Uh, I, I actually took mine. It, it, was, it was an upright. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he asked for it. I was like, yeah. Uh, I really want to do Sahib Kano. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Manish is a big fan of the, of the Perfect Girlfriends. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see here, Holy Grail series for me. I definitely want to do Humanity Has Declined. Oh my oh, god, yes. yes! I will translate that myself in the infinite time space that I will create in my mind. <laughs> Just like in the series! <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but but, but I, I got some bad news for you, that's show.com, and they don't, they don't license digital rights, so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's why it's a Holy Grail. It wouldn't be a Holy Grail if I could license it. <laughs> Okay, uh, more questions, sorry. Uh, yes, you in the back back. Yeah. Uh, so, I was just wondering, you said you worked with Katakawa now, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any possibility of getting the rights to classic literature book? What, which one? Hyoka, the classic oh. literature Ah, Hyoka, yeah. right. Um, uh, so, uh, Hyoka was uh, asked uh, actually on, on uh, Curious Cat the other day, and I believe I gave a response which depressed people, uh, which was that, I believe Hyoka has been too well fan translated. <laughs> it's finished, the fan translation is totally finished basically, and it's been totally finished for a while. And what I've noticed about fan translations and XR sales is that if it's ongoing or like not a terrible quality, then us doing it is, is often a, a you know, good thing. But if it's been finished for a while as a fan translation and the translations are out there on the internet, and anybody can access them, it, it depresses sales too much. So uh, would I like to do that? Could I access it from Kanakawa? Probably. But I'm not sure it's on top of my list because of that. <laughs> so sorry for a negative answer there, but that's the truth. More questions. Uh, you have the front Yeah, it's also for another series. Mm -hmm. You know, the Evelier's Chronicles. It's a book award series that was adapted on the Ethereum platform. Ah, uh, well, what's the name again? Uh, Evelier's Chronicles. Okay. By Doctor of Evil. Oh, right. Yes, those. Um, actually, I already inquired about those. The the. A lot of the Vocaloid books that are actually like Vocaloid Vocaloid books that like involve the characters sort of themselves, <coughs> the rights to those are owned or controlled by Krypton. 
And, and the publishers in Japan are just sort of like licensing the rights to the characters, and it gets, makes the licensing of them very complicated. So uh, I actually approached the publisher of those books about that, and they told me to approach Krypton, and I approached Krypton, and then Krypton never got back to me. So, uh, <laughs> does that translation for those are? Yeah, and I understand that those the fan translations of those are are, are bad, but uh, and I actually be interested in those uh, pretty well. We'll see how Echo does as it's hopefully adjacent, uh, and, and if it does really well, then I might consider going after those harder. Yeah. Okay. Do you need to contact the author? The author, no, author doesn't have any rights to that. That doesn't work like that. You can't direct contact directly the author because they wouldn't have the rights to the, the images or anything, and more importantly, they 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 can't sell the rights to the books. And they, they, they would have to contact their editor who would then get the publisher itself. But because it's Vocaloid related, that means Krypton, on, Krypton has the final say over anything. So you have to go through Krypton to actually get the rights of those. It, it's a complicated issue because those books have multiple people who own multiple IPs that are involved, uh, which make licensing very difficult for those books. <laughs> anyway, sorry to be uh, you know, businessy on that, but that's the way those work. Okay, uh, more questions. How about you? What is your uh, thought about the fan uh, on the web to translate the song? The fan translation? Uh, can you ask a more specific question? Or what is your thought about this? Well, well, okay, so focusing just on fan translation of light novels uh, as opposed to manga or anime or whatever else, I'm just going to talk about light novel fan translation. Um, I feel that the current state of fan translation is is very precarious and degrading. Um, I think the quality, the average quality of fan translation of light novels is terrible, for one thing. And, but, and there are a couple of groups out there that do high quality work, uh, but that they're few and far between. And I'm looking at this as a fan, like, you know, are you doing justice to the, to the novel? Uh, I'm not really, like, I'm not even saying from a business perspective, I'm just talking about the quality. Um, a lot of people are now accepting machine translation and then re-editing, which is just completely beyond the pale. People will seem to read whatever uh, just horrible machine translated crap there is, if that's the only option. And the worst, however, is that I've seen a lot of groups that are now starting to turn their fan translations into a business and putting work, putting their translations behind things like Patreon, paywalls, and actually earning income from it. I have some news for fan translators who are earning income from their fan translation. That's not fan translation. That's illegal translation that will be sued. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you can't, you, just as you can't make a living, uh, you know, uh, uh, selling your covers of Disney musicals uh, without getting permission from Disney, uh, you can't make a living trying to sell your translations of, of other people's works without their permission. Uh, the way copyright works, and and Patreon support is still selling them. There's various reasons, you know, there's various gray areas, but that just goes beyond the pale. And the worst thing is that most of those people are not even doing proper translation; they're machine translated crap. So uh, it's amazing to me what people will pay money for <laughs> when we have a real, actual, real translators and editors doing good work. That like you know. So um, I feel like actually our, the existence of our company has done a lot to, um, to raise the profile of light novels. So in some ways that just makes more and more fan translation happen. Uh, but I think it's also raised the profile of officially translated light novels as being high quality. And the more we can get our quality out there in, in the zeitgeist, uh, the more people will be like, I'm not paying for this terrible machine translation. I'm going to pay for the actual ebook. It's only seven dollars on Amazon, you know. So uh, I feel like we can compete with them, honestly, yeah. especially if they're starting to charge money. <laughs> so yeah, right. So uh, I feel like I'm not too worried about fan translation hurting our business. If anything, I'm worried about fan translating hurting authors themselves, and and that I think is sad. Uh, but the more we educate people, the more we do a good job putting out content that's high quality, I think the, the better that'll get. Okay, more questions. Do you want, you want to? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to also note that, like, in a way, the reason for the decrease in fan translation quality is because, uh, I mean, a lot of the better translators who fan translated just move on to actually doing official work. Mm -hmm. So you're pretty much left with the people who aren't maybe in that category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely siphon off the talent that is actually talent. 
and uh, and I'm accepting of people's past as long as they uh, are accepting of being a pro means being professional, and that's fine. And as you know, I, I look at people in terms of what kind of quality work they can produce, and not really a, 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 you know what their what their past has done or anything. So uh, I think that also a, a brain drain. A talent drain also has happened on the fan translation community because of companies like us. So I apologize. <laughs> um, okay, more questions. How about you, there? So I just, I just walked in, decided to meet uh, the whole light, the whole light novel sort of aspect of, of uh, I guess Japanese, Korean, Chinese, whatever uh, authorship has sort of been something like new for me that I sort of did, uh, sort of come upon, uh, come across. And so, like, I've been reading, yeah, like, poor quality, machine translated garbage, and things like that. And, of course, like, the whole issue of, like, <coughs> scanned uh, copies of, like, stuff produced that have been officially translated, gray areas, and just not at all gray areas, just completely legal shit regarding manga and anime. Like, we're kind of aware of that, but as far as, as like, light novels are concerned, I don't know if I'm the only one who's not really aware of it, but I feel like it's not so much uh, as common knowledge, at least within the fandom. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I understand what you're getting at. A lot of people who read the the translations of light, of light novels and also Chinese novels and Korean novels, they're sort of all up together and often online. Uh, they don't even understand that it's it's elite, it's a copyright violation to translate something and then put it out there. Because and a lot of this is sort of, well, I can explain this simply, but a lot of the, what's being translated is not light novels, but the web novels that are often then, you know, published as light novels. But uh, on in Japan, there's a big site called Shosetsu Naro and Alpha Police and sites like that where people can post for free. Anybody can read for free their web novels, right? And there are similar sites in English. Uh, and so a lot of people, a lot of fan groups, will will really think to themselves, oh well. This is, you know, we can read these for this for free, and they're posting it for free in Japanese. So obviously, we can translate it and post it for free elsewhere, and that's not a problem. Uh, a lot of people just don't understand how copyright works, and the simple answer is that yes, that's the problem. Just because I post something online for free doesn't mean give anyone else the right to do anything with it without my permission. You can't translate it and post it somewhere else. You can't repost it. Uh, then it, now in America, you can link to it. That's something I think that there's legal precedent. Uh, but you can't just translate my work and post it somewhere else. You definitely can't translate and post it somewhere else and charge money for it, right? Uh, so a lot of people, though, they think to themselves, oh, it's, it's available for free in Japanese, so it should be available for free in English, too. And unless you have the permission of the author, no, you can't do it. And I think education about that is something that you know we slowly need to uh, to work for. Well, just on the subject of education about that, like that's you touched on what I was saying, and, and that's kind of what I was getting at. Just as in you, as your organization, with however, however uh, large or influential you are, or whatever, uh, but do you feel that you're you're uh, investing time and effort in sort of like you said trying to educate the community and, and sort of bring bring talent and recognize talent and engage and involve them in the way that like for me when I think of translators I think like people working in government and people who are doing translations of books into other uh, languages but it's never really like uh, you know like light novels from China or from Japan so. Do you find that people who are legit translators who have studied or who do it really well sort of don't veer into this kind of field as well because it's maybe not as well uh, recognized or treated fairly or whatever? Well, um, okay, I think there are two questions there, so let me separate them up. In terms of what we as J Novel Club are doing to kind of outreach to the, uh, the people who are reading, you know, illegally translated stuff and fan translated stuff, um, I think the best thing that I, we do and the thing I, I focus on is that we just keep pumping out consistent high quality content. And what really, what convinces people the most that they should pay for content is the quality of it. And if we make it push out quality content that's obviously better quality than the stuff that the fans are producing, then people will understand that there's a difference, right? Uh, and it, Going into like a novel updates forums and posting how we they're all pirates and should feel bad is not gonna help, <laughs> right? 
Uh, I mean, I do that sometimes just for fun, but no. Um, <laughs> but actually, there was, there was a couple times when I started some trouble on, on the farm. But, you know, it was, so every once in a while, I do just kind of like make my voice work. And, and I personally do interact with fans a lot. So, uh, but I have a very strict policy about not blaming the readers. I don't really think it's their fault that they're reading. You know, they're not a bad person for reading things illegally or scam online and we're not paying for something, you know, maybe they can't afford it, whatever. Uh, but all I can do as a company is show them that our product is worth their money. And then it's really up to them to make the decision that to actually, to actually give it to us. <laughs> I don't like to guilt your people and saying, you're not supporting the authors, you're a terrible person. I, no, it's not <coughs> about supporting the authors actually, it's about paying for something of value. And yes, the something of value is this author's writing and our translation, right? Uh, but we can't, people shouldn't be guilt tripped into giving money because of a cause. This is the end product. I'm, we're creating something, we're a business, I'm selling you something, and I want to make sure that it's worth your money. That's, I, maybe I'm old fashioned, <laughs> but I feel like that's what's important. Your second question about translators and sort of the communities that they're in. I, we hire translators that are like, at masters in translation, that have gone to college, that have done important things. We hire translators that have self-taught themselves from translating their own visual novel, you know, like for two years. Like, I take people from all walks of life. One thing that is sort of the unifying factor in them all is that they want to translate fiction. Like, there are some translators that enjoy translating nonfiction, business reports, whatever, based on those. But I think, like, one guy actually translates for us. He was a patent translator for five years. He is translating bio, biology medical patents and making a ton of money doing it. And he just couldn't do it anymore. He was like, I gotta, I can't stand, I gotta translate something fun. And it turns out he's a huge Otaku the whole time. And so he's like, you know, yeah, I can translate my novels. I mean, I get people from all walks of life and translators and the reunifying factor of them is they wanna translate something fun and interesting. Thanks for your answer. Yeah, no problem. All right, more questions. Uh, how about you on the right there? Uh, do you have any novel that would hit in the web but wasn't popular in Japan? Um, yes and no. Uh, I would say uh, uh, Realist Hero, our number one seller. How Realist Hero Rebuilt the Kingdom? Whoa. <laughs> it's a chair book? Chair book. Oh my. Um, <laughs> a Realist Hero is uh, uh, is like our biggest title, selling title. I've said that before. It sold more than, I think we sold like, 70,000 copies of that series. And uh, it is definitely like a huge deal. Uh, uh, and in, the, in Japan, it sells well. It's a decent series. It's not gonna break into the top 10 list. So, I mean, I, I still think it sells more in Japan than it does in the West, but we're probably pretty close to like, you know, 30% of the overall sales at this point on that series. So uh, that's definitely one where it's more popular in the West than it is in Japan. Uh, there are a couple other, it, it's not like a, there's nothing where it's like, it sells amazing in the West and nothing in Japan. Because if it sold nothing in Japan, it wouldn't be made. <laughs> it's a late novel that just get canceled. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, there's never anything that bad. But, interesting question. Okay, how about you in the front? Uh, what are the challenges running the, the company? The challenges? challenges running the company? Hmm. I thought the challenges have changed over time. In the beginning, it was making sure I don't lose all my money. <laughs> and after we started being more profitable, uh, the challenge became getting enough talent to handle all the content that I want to do, and that's still a challenge. And at this point, the challenge is figuring out how to manage all of the various projects I want to do. Like uh, one thing that we announced at Anime Expo and I can read out here is that we're going to be adding manga to our service as well. And so you have to get all that going, you have to license it, I have to make sure the staff understands how to do manga, I have to make sure the website can handle streaming it, there's lots of things to do. Uh, it's uh, a lot of issues now that I, the challenges I have running the company is that I need to hire people to do things because I don't have enough time to do everything anymore. And that's uh, something that just takes a lot of time. I gotta find people I trust, I gotta hire them, I gotta promote them, I know and I make a real company instead of just uh, Sam and his friends uh, situation, which we sort of are. Uh, but I mean, we have like 50 freelancers at this point. You know, it's, it's not a small operation. And we're doing, you know, I, I mean, we're doing almost, you know, millions of dollars in every year. So I have the, I have the ability to make a 
more solid company and it's just the time to do it is what's uh, taking up uh, the, the biggest bottleneck. Okay, I think we have a couple more questions. Time for a couple more questions. Uh, how about you and the man there? Uh, just a licensing uh, suggestion. If you could get I said Rubian, it's again Rubuchi novel, it's just like Rubani. Uh, what's the name of it again? Uh, I said Rubian. Okay. Uh, uh, it's an Urobuchi Uru, Uru, novel, huh? Yeah, it's from Gagaga Bonko. Ah, uh, okay, Gagaga. Gagaga yeah, Gaga yeah. Shogun Khan, so why yeah. not? <laughs> they're, the ones, they're the ones that. Uh, uh, right, not that show, show yeah. Khan, right? yeah, they're the ones who don't do ebook licenses. <laughs> but also, it's Urobuchi again, so it's probably related to Maker Plus, and that would make this complicated as well. Uh, sort of the same reason why a lot of people ask me for the Fate, uh, uh, you know, Fate's Day Night novels of various sorts, Fate Zero, Fate Zero etc. And I, one of these days, I'll, I'll I'll try it, but it's going to be so complicated. The license is going to be so complicated. I just I want to I want to put my effort in elsewhere right now. <laughs> okay, how about you in the back, the, behind the head? Yeah. yeah, I just oh, you already asked me. Yeah, but I just want to keep you back off the Fate thing. Fate, Strange Fate, written by uh, Kenta Narita, is actually published under Katakawa. Right, so I, I know that, but just because it's published under Katakawa doesn't mean I don't have to go through Animax. Oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, all right, there you go. Is there a possibility of getting Kino a copy? Because I know that I got it was getting translated before, but the one for the stuff to go over. My bid was rejected for Kino no My bid was rejected. You might ask why. I don't know. <laughs> Probably because it didn't offer enough money. Okay. Um, yeah. I have a question about the industry as a whole. As a translator, is there a certain amount, like, what's the average amount of money you make with as a translator? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I'm not the translator, I'm the owner. Uh, but, uh, well, I mean, I don't know. I think I, I'll ask instances of you because I don't want to force you guys to talk about your own income. Yeah. I, I actually don't even keep track. He doesn't make any money. I, I force him to work for free. <laughs> 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 uh, no, more specifically, what, what kind of what kind of questions do you have about the approach for translators to make? Uh, well, it depends on how much work they do. Uh, so, I mean, are you asking like per character, uh, per page, per novel, per novel? Well, obviously, it depends on whether it's a five hundred page novel or a two hundred page novel. So, um, I, I would say this: I don't want to like talk too much about freelancer prices. If you're interested, take my test, and I'll eventually tell you how much I paid. Um, <laughs> but uh, I sort of set rates so that someone who is doing two novels at a time, or two books at a time, so around like one novel a month rate, if you can translate a novel a month, you can make a living working for J Novel Club. Not a very good living, but a low enough living. And now, not too many translators are good enough to translate at that speed, but if you are, then you can just translate that novel. I have a couple translators who basically are full time for us, and they are the ones who do two books. So, so one of them is doing three, but you know, he's crazy. Maybe like a one <laughs> book a, a week or something. Uh, well, I mean, Derek. <laughs> I thought you said something like that. He I'm said fine. that in the previous battle, you could translate one novel a week for Elfride. Yeah. For Elfride. <laughs> <laughs> he also has a day job. So. Yeah, he's got a whole day job though. I mean, but, uh, honestly though, like, how long could you keep up a pace of one novel a week? Uh, if I wasn't also doing my yeah. day job, probably for three weeks and then I'll burn out. Yeah, see, that's the thing. He, you can translate a novel in a week, and you can do that for maybe two, three weeks in a row, and then you'll, yeah, then you'll have to rest for five months, because you'd be so sick. Uh, the reason I do this is because of my day job and uh, the unpredictability of my schedule, is that I need to front load the work so that if I suddenly have a two month period where I'm unable to touch translation, uh, it does not affect any of our schedules. Yeah, yeah. and that's what happens when you have a real job. <laughs> but uh, most people actually work in a more steady pace uh, than Derek here. And I find that most translators can easily handle a novel every two months, and some of the better ones can actually do like two at a time at that pace. And that's sort of how I set my rates. Steiner wants to point out that he's doing three. Yeah, but one of them is caught up to Japan. <laughs> so, you know, he only gets a new volume of that every couple months. So, uh, anyway, then, yeah, Steiner does three. He's crazy. Um, okay, more questions? Uh, okay, yeah. Well, about the same question as Kino and uh, Otavi, but with uh, Scrap Princess. Is uh, there still hope of getting the rest? I think there's a real hope of Scrap Princess, because uh, we publish a bunch of Ichiro Sakaki's other works. 
Uh, and I'm a big fan of his, and I really like Scrap Princess too, personally. Uh, so, uh, it's an older series. It was published, how many volumes were published by Tokyo Pop? Three. Three. So, three volumes came out by Tokyo Pop back in the day in 2009, and then got canceled. <sighs> I want to do it. I'm not sure it would be a good business decision. <laughs> but I'll think about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, you're the part. Uh, yes. Oh. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, 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 Lady Dungeon Master title in Japanese was longer. Is there a reason why it was made shorter? Uh, sure. Uh, let's see. Where was it? Uh, there it is. Oh, wait. It doesn't have the. We raised we the original Japanese. I believe the full, tra the full literal translation was uh, the Dungeon Master uh, absolutely positively does not want to work and just wants to sleep all day. I believe it would be like a literal translation of the full of the full title. Um, the reason why I shortened it this one is because it just has a nice ring to it, we felt, and the longer version that the Japanese was didn't really add anything. <laughs> like it's like, yes, the lazy dungeon master the, we we deleted the he just wants to sleep all day part. And we felt that in this case, having the long light novel title was not like doing the thing any favors. It just wasn't a very good long title, right? <laughs> so uh, we went with just Lazy Dungeon Master. It seems easier, and everybody seems to call it LDM. So yeah, it's easier for people to remember because we decided to go with the short title on this one. We're trying it out. We'll see how it goes. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, okay, you do have a question. Um, how do you do your marketing? Marketing. Uh, the best, the we, way we do our marketing is pretty simple. <laughs> Uh, people read our books and they tell their friends about them. Like, uh, I spend very little money on marketing. I do Twitter a lot. I, we have a newsletter that we send out every once in a while because it's hard, it's hard to find time to do it. Uh, but in terms of paid marketing, we don't do very much at all. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and we've managed to see a lot of growth uh, without marketing. Uh, I'm sure at some point in time, marketing will become necessary but until that point in time, I'm not going to waste money on it. I'm going to license books and translate them. I, any dollar that's spent on marketing is probably better spent on content. That's my philosophy. Uh, and then the content will be the marketing. Okay, more questions. How about you, Brian? Yes. You were talking about earlier how uh, you had some publishers that were not really open to doing uh, digital licensing. Mm. Has your recent success in general changed some minds about that? Well, Kanata will be a good example of that. Right. I mean, you know, obviously, I like would have loved to have licensed from Kanakawa a year ago, uh, but it's without the numbers that we put up, they wouldn't have talked to me in the first place because they have, you know, they own. 51% of the end press. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the fact that we have the numbers we do and we can prove that we have a market uh, definitely opens doors. Uh, the publishers that don't want to license ebooks are, many of them, it's not a business decision, it's a philosophy decision <laughs> upon uh, on the part of executive board members that are old fashioned and that don't believe that licensing digital only or digital overseas is in the best interest of their authors. They feel that it lessens the, the they feel that it lessens the work if it's not on paper, and I know there are people who are paper fundamentalists too, and it's just an old, it's an old fashioned uh, way of thinking, and I and I think it will change with time, and it will just take time. So that's that's it, you know we can be as successful as possible, but it, it, you know at some point we have to wait for the old people to die. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, actually, so if you go to our website and you uh, click around the titles and the list and the title lists, um, and it will actually like it'll show you all the parts, even if you're not logged in or not, don't have a membership. They'll just be grayed out and say members only, uh, and you can see what's available. Uh, one thing about our membership that I made that's a that's a little uh, tricky is that uh, members can read the latest volume, but they can't read the older volumes. It's only the ones that are currently being translated that you can read, uh, and then and the and sometimes we. Every month we have two series where you can read all the volumes uh, and uh, catch up, and we rotate around. But generally, like if you want to read from volume one 
uh, you need to buy the ebooks for all the older volumes, and then you can catch up to the latest ones that we're translating. So the membership doesn't give you access to read just everything that we publish. Okay. It's just the latest volumes. Yeah. And sometimes we have free trials and stuff uh, with our membership. If you pay close attention to our Twitter, I know, uh, sometimes only free trials, but very rarely actually, only like twice a year. Uh, yeah, also uh, part ones for most series oh. of volume ones are always free. Yeah, yeah, and part one is always free, so we, anybody can read the part ones. And there are a couple series that are free for everyone, like Robojoma, Invaders of the Robojoma, you can read volumes one through 15, uh, even uh, just if you're free, uh, just have a basic membership, but no, no actual, uh, uh, not a membership, but just a basic account. Uh, because that used to be a fan translation, so we're making sure that that's still available for free. Um, uh, that's the way we're doing it. But the latest volume, 29, that's not great. You have to be a member for that. Uh, let's see, any questions? Uh, ooh, well, you already asked questions before. Anyone who asked, asked a question yet want a question? No. Uh, you already asked a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, fine, I'll be you then. Uh, I, I don't continue your transmission about my, my list is in, in retail. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I will finish it. What did you say? Will I finish it? I will finish it. Damn it. <laughs> that will take forever, yes. Well, uh, uh, let, me explain, let me explain the context because nobody cares about this except for like five people. Um, uh, so when one of our launch titles was My Little Sister Can Read Kanji, and I translated it myself because I, it's my kind of book. Anyway, um, <laughs> I don't want to get into like, the book itself, but it's a crazy parody of like, Little Sister novels. But, um, uh, I did it, translated myself because one, I wanted to save money, and two, it was like I wanted to sort of make sure that I knew what it was like to translate my novels so I could have a better sense of my business and my freelancers. But at some point in time, I'm like, I'm running a company, I don't have time to do this anymore, but I can't force anyone else to translate this series. It's, it's way too insane for anyone else. So I've gotten through four, four volumes, and there's only one volume left, volume five. I'm going to do it, I have to do it, or um, I have to do it before the end of the year, or then I actually might like expire the license by accident. So um, <laughs> I'm definitely going to finish it. Please be patient. My masterpiece will be done. <laughs> uh, so thanks, thanks for caring. Uh, I'm like you're one of the thirty people who buys it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Oh right, I almost forgot. What about that? Okay, so um, hmm. I've got a good giveaway for this uh, amazing clear file. Uh, now not the seventeen more, which will be coming out of print from us. Uh, uh, so uh, let me ask you a question. What kind of question do you want to ask? Oh, what is the name of the game that uh, Diablo uh, plays so much? Okay, you in the front. Yes, good job. You got it. Oh, that's cool. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, and I guess that's all the time we have. Um, yeah, that is. It's really all the time we have. We gotta get kicked out. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, <laughs>